Welcome to Take 5 with Timothy. I'm your host, Rebecca Haas, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Pacific Opera Victoria. In each episode of this program, founder and artistic director of Pacific Opera and renowned conductor Timothy Vernon will explore an area of the arts that he is passionate about. It's a chance to have a sneak peek, to do a bit of a deeper dive, and learn some more about the many facets of the life of a conductor and an artistic director. Today we're joined by a very special guest, Michael Shimada, the Artistic Director of the Belfry Theatre here in Victoria, British Columbia. Take Five with Timothy is based on my idea that to engage in a conversation with Timothy would be a very long, well-rounded, great exploration. And I felt I had to sort of limit the number of places we'd go. And so I've set myself the challenge of five questions that we'll explore in each episode. And today I'm going to be talking to Michael and Timothy about being artistic directors, something both of these gentlemen have in common. And we'll explore five questions about the role of the artistic director. So let's get started with today's talk. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Rebecca. I thought it might be good to start with the job description. I don't know that everyone really knows what an artistic director does. I think I've only ever had a vague sense. Maybe it's more personal than I think, but I would love for each of you to tell me a little bit about if you had to write your job description, what would you write in it? That's a very good question. I would like to defer to our <laughs> guest. <laughs> nice one. Um, <laughs> It's hard. I find it very difficult when people ask me. Um, I suppose the, the the simple answer is that I, I direct the artistic um, kind of journey of the of the theater. But I think um, of late, I would say over the last few years, I've realized it's more about uh, creating a relationship with the audience and then programming uh, pieces that I think the audience is going to uh, respond to. But respond to because I think it's um, uh, in programming, I try to uh, uh, stay a little bit ahead of the audience to, to offer them different perspectives on, on the world around us. Uh, so uh, programming is, is obviously the major and the most obvious part of the job. But also, um, you know, the atmosphere in the theater is, is, is uh, something that I need to be aware of, although we have a remarkable staff and it doesn't take any but, but you know, obviously that stuff does come from the top sometimes, and so setting that kind of, uh, that mood and the way that artists are treated. Uh, I was saying to Timothy the other day that I, I did once work in a theater that didn't actually have an artistic director. It had a producer, and uh, it was palpable how, how the fact that nobody in, the, in that organization actually was thinking about the artists, and the, the lack of that was remarkable. So I do try to keep that in mind as well. I try to think, is this a battle I should fight or not? And I think, no, yes, I should, because that's what my job. My job is to stand up for the artists and make sure that the art is being protected. Again, not something that I need to do on a daily basis at the Belfry by any means. Um, and then, of course, there's a responsibility to the community and to, to training and outreach and you know, being, connecting the Belfry to the community as much as possible. Um, and writing. Writing. Just once, <laughs> just once I would like to see a job description when somebody's, you know, when, when there's a job search going on that says, must be an excellent writer, because you spend 50% of your time, it seems like, writing grants, writing letters to donors, letters to subscribers, program notes, uh, it, it letters of recommendation for people. It, it's, it's, uh, that's a major part of the job that, that nobody ever, I don't think any board or search committee ever actually takes into consideration. Anyway, that's a bit of a scattershot description. <laughs> no, but, it's great. But I'm beginning to wonder if you ever sleep. <laughs> uh, well, it, I, you know, it is. It, it, yeah, it's a, the thing is, just when you think you know what you're going to do for the day, there's a press release to be proofed, and things happen. something something yeah. comes across your desk, and it's hard to. Uh, time management is something that uh, is important, and I'm not sure that I'm very good at. <laughs> <laughs> Needs improvement, Timothy. What's in your job description? Well, it's interesting because it's evolved. I began here <laughs> decades ago with absolutely no experience in that function. But they wanted somebody who knew opera. And I was a working conductor, so I was able to do a couple of operas a season, come home and visit my folks, never dreaming that this endeavor, formed largely by singers who had retired from careers they didn't actually have, would emerge into something Significant. It wasn't something I foresaw. That was my fault. 
I was still battling and still trying to be out there being a working stiff conductor and getting gigs and finding an orchestra or doing all those things. But gradually, I began to understand that as Michael has said, it really is about shaping and determining something. You do have a great influence in terms of how your own community and your own audience sees your art and, and responds to it, and what voyages and adventures you can take them on, and what responsibility you have to do that. It's perhaps more of a cliche business than theater. So Michael, you're dealing with new plays every season. We're not mm -hmm. dealing with new operas every season. Yep. In fact, there's a canon of sort of standard works that the audience expects to see, not all the time, and certainly after a number of years of seeing a broader range, not even every season, but that's sort of a skeletal framework for the repertoire that you do bring. Beyond that, I found, there's no end. You have to know, like you, you have to know a huge number of scores inside out and upside down. Uh, leading the community and finding that sense of what is going to be next for them. It's not always easy, but it's a, a product of an educated sensibility, in my belief, and a lot of intuition, you know, because you have a feel, and it isn't a selfish feel, for what's right, when it's right. At a certain point in our history, Pacific Opera used to produce what came to be known as Timothy's Follies, <laughs> which were the, the middle opera of the season of three. And uh, those were the operas which we, we t went farther off the path even than usual. But now we have a more integrated approach to programming, and the audience has come to expect that, that there will be a balance. It won't be all familiar. It won't be all unfamiliar. But that there will always be value, that there will always be something profound, something real, I insist on substance, and even if it's at the lighter end of, you know, operetta, for example, that too has an enormous function for the spirit. And the great and inspired composers brought something inimical to us in that genre. So I have no hesitation in, in prom promoting it and defending it and choosing it. The other side that, Michael, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it, Essentially, as an artistic director, the choice is important, the choice of the repertoire. But then comes who's going to sing it? Who's going to direct it? Who's going to design it? Who's going to, you know, et, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And it just goes on and on and on. Those things, fortunately, in opera, we're used to doing a couple of years ahead. Yep. Right? So that we, because singers' availabilities and all those other things. So I've had to educate myself, and my director friends would say, inadequately in that side of the theater as well. Because I want to be not meddling in it, but I want to be assured in myself that I can be responsible for this production. We've had a couple of times when, you know, I've learned that lesson the hard way and just determined after that, no, I'm not gonna just let it slide, let it happen, let it be obvious. What I do like to do though, is when we've determined on a piece and I've decided the director will be so-and-so, I like to talk to that so-and-so and see what he, she feels about casting, about the other elements, what designer they like to work with, et cetera, et cetera. So it becomes collaborative. It isn't just a dictatorship, you know. And it's not something in art you would ever want, really, because I don't think any good comes of that. So it is a collaboration. And I'm fortunate, indeed, in having a staff that loves to write grants. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lucky <Simple>. you. <laughs> so now I've had the long version of your jobs. I will set you the challenge that business students always get, which is how do you pitch yourself in an elevator? So if you had to sort of boil down the essence of your job and make it fit into the, you know, the ride from the first floor to the 15th floor, um, Michael, we're going to start with you again. No. I've never pitched myself in an elevator, but... Um, <laughs> I guess I'd say, I, I, I probably would say I pick plays. I pick plays. Yeah, probably. Yeah, which is a terrible way of saying it, but. No, it's good. It it's, gets way yeah, but you know, you know, I mean, what I wanted to say when you were, when you were uh, describing the job, and I think this is something we have in common, that we, um, you have to follow your own taste as well, right? Like Absolutely. you actually have to, yeah. and you can't, um, you can't pursue the audience. That's, that's 
deadly and 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 no one can succeed. You, you, there's no way to know no, what an audience no, no, will no, no, or won't no. like. You have to do pieces that yeah. you believe in and that you think are pertinent to the time and that they have something to say, which is what, what you're saying. No, it's absolutely true. There are profound, uh, well-known examples of companies that have decided, oh gosh, we're in trouble. Let's do Bohem and Butterfly and Barber. Boom, they're gone in a year because who cares, yep. you know? Yep. So yes, Butterfly, but with something, something, yeah. something. Yeah. If I were in an elevator, I would just say, I pick operas, and then I make all the decisions around producing them. And I even am able to hire myself as conductor. Great advantage. <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose no. as director. You well, it's true. I, I mean, I, I always think I've, I've chosen a good season if I actually want to direct everything in it, although I, I obviously can't and don't. But, Why not? But, well, because <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of freelancers out there. Okay. There's <laughs> lots of people looking for work all the time. <laughs> Lots of people. Um, I know this is sort of an odd question, but I am curious about this because I think artistic director, and that's what I'm hearing, it's different for different people. It's different in different institutions. Size of institution makes a difference. When you stepped into these roles, were there people that you looked to that inspired you or that you wanted to model yourself after or the way that you wanted to walk as an artistic director that helped you when you started out? It's rather daunting. Um. Well, I, I had the great benefit of assisting Bill Glasgow when he was uh, the artistic director of Center Stage Company, which then merged while we were there, while I was there, merged with Toronto Free Theatre and became Canadian Stage. Um, and so, watching Bill and and how he uh, executed the job was was a big learning curve for me. Also, I think um, in my previous life, I was a stage manager, and I was. Uh, at Stratford, I was John Hirsch's stage manager when he was the artistic director, so I was aware about, of, of, of and, and also, uh, I was, the first two years that I was at Stratford, Robin Phillips was artistic director, and that, that was a remarkable thing to watch. That was an artistic director. Yeah, there was not one decision that was made by anybody without his approval. Every time you take a coffee break during rehearsal, there would be a line of 20 people saying, do you approve this, do you approve this, do you approve and he, it, it was, uh, yeah, it was astounding, astounding. And, and, and he'd be directing three productions at the same time. I love the story. Okay, we can do story. I <laughs> love the story about it's, the it's props. It's Timothy's show. Your name's in the title. You know, Talk. the props department, don't know the show, can't oh, remember I, the show. Oh, I, 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 I have one And there was this thing, and it was produced and presented, and Philip said, no, no, get it off. So off it went. Then he said, no, bring it back. Bring it back. We'll try again. And then, no, 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 after a couple of rehearsals, it went. So the props department made a little slide. You know, the doctor is in, out, and they had this thing with, the prop, whatever it is, in, out, and it would slide back a foot. I, I saw him once <laughs> say to a designer, I want a bench, and just stood there and said, rhymed off the dimensions. The bench arrived from props. He looked at it, he said, those, are not, that's not, those aren't the dimensions that I asked for. And they would <laughs> maybe off by like two inches or something, but, but he was that's right. That's it, that's it. But the other artistic director I want to mention is Glynis. Uh, of the course. Slation because, uh, you know, the... The atmosphere, the essence of what the Belfry is, uh, she and Mary created during their time at the Belfry, and so uh, I'm very much aware of that legacy and and just the kind of work that Glynis was doing, and you know the appetite that she created for for some some you know work that was kind of outside the the normal envelope. Uh, yeah, so I'm very much aware that 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 the a lot of what the people about what the audience loves about the Belfry is is what Glynis and Mary put into effect. That's a pretty powerful artistic director if you put all those elements together that yes, you described. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Gee. <laughs> I wish I had a kind of a partnership or mentor or somebody to work with. I mean, I, I learned about opera because I lived in Europe for 11 years starting at age 18. And I went to opera all the time, five, six nights a week. And I saw opera in big cities and small cities. I got to know the how the big companies work and how the little companies work, but it was a very, very, very different system, as you know, over there. So it, it, that wasn't necessarily helpful in setting up my own idea mm -hmm. of how a company should run. And I had a lot to learn, and I still have a lot to learn, because we're in a completely different atmosphere, an atmosphere where the art form itself does not have a long and distinguished history, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm speaking of North America in general, whereas theater, has a much more kind of mm, fluid history. And there's always been elements of theatrical production and presentation with, in every peoples and at every mm -hmm. time and in every period. 
um, offers a construct, and it's hard to, you know, I have to remind myself of that. But uh, so I haven't had, a, you know, and if you look at the, across the country, we are a rare breed in opera. You are. In you fact, are. I think there's only one other company, namely Montreal, that has a position designated as artistic director. So often, and this is partly because boards like it this way, it's become a corporate model where you have a general director who is responsible for the whole thing, both the artistic side and the financial mm -hmm. side. You show me the person who's equally good at both. So it's a matter of finding the right mix of staff and other things to complement that. And if you have a good business manager and you hire a good musician to be your music director, you're well on the way to something that will work. Casting director is another thing because knowledge of voice, mm -hmm. which like there is no exact equivalent in theater because no. the voice has to do certain things in opera. And you have to know what those things are deeply. You have to know what the requirements are. You have to match it to the voice that may be auditioning for you yep. and know whether this is appropriate or not appropriate. Yep. Unless we're doing a musical. And, well, yep. a little, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's the same, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But so, that's why, because you're an artist, because POV has an artistic director, that's why you know, your repertoire is so much more interesting than 90% of the companies in North America. Well, I like to think so because, well, people have been very supportive. The board was supportive, the audience was supportive. There's been a, a kind of, people have gathered around it and found it very interesting. And I'm grateful for that. I'm very grateful for that. I could not imagine being in a house that required one to conduct top 10 yeah. year after year after year. It's just, you know, and yet, we're all friends. There are a couple of companies in Canada that seem to do only that. I mean, with few little wrinkles, you know. I don't know why. There's 400 years of opera. Get on it. <laughs> you know what? I, I want to add one more artistic director to the list because uh, he's very overlooked, and that's Paxton Whitehead, who used to run oh, the yeah. Shop Festival, yeah, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. where I started my career. And uh, this is so he was, that was pre Christopher Newton, and and that long tenure that Christopher had, remarkable tenure, kind of. Paxton is sort of forgotten, but he always managed to put together a company that was extremely happy for a very long period of time that we were all together. And that is an art in itself, just putting together companies. That's that, so yeah. true. That's yeah. so true. I mean, one of the reasons when, when I took this job, one of the ex I had experience with most of the other companies, and some of them were fine, but there were a couple that were miserable. And you knew that all the artists, including the conductor himself, were looking over your shoulder, how are we doing? Every, audition, every rehearsal's like an audition, and you wonder. So when I came to this position, I made a vow, an inner vow. I took a vow to myself <laughs> saying, it's not gonna be like that here. We're not gonna have that. And we haven't, mm -hmm. with very few exceptions, and we've been able to deal with them because they were exceptions. But by and large, the happy, reputation that the company has in the business is of a happy place to work and a safe place to work and a respectful place to work. And that's as it's, rewarding as any artistic it is. achievement. It is. And you, you know. get better work that way. Oh, sure. So I'm going to pin you, Timothy, and say you still haven't named an artistic director that might have inspired you because it's true. But the job that you have here is a very particular one and the depth of knowledge of voices, the way that you create the community. Um, did you have any role models for this or do you feel like you've basically created this from your own vision? I've you had to it? put it together from various sources. Yeah. There hasn't been a single person doing all the aspects of it that I could observe or ask or, you know. But I learned from coaches, I learned from conductors, I learned from intendants, which is the, the European, middle European title for someone who runs the house without necessarily being either a musician or a singer or a director or in any way attached to the function and performance of the art, but who has a sovereign overview and a depth of knowledge, because this is very, very important. And it's something that it's a lifetime, takes a lifetime to acquire. So in saying those things, I wasn't being uh, disrespectful of somebody who might have helped me. As a conductor, I can go on and on and on. But it's a different episode. It's a different episode. And it's, a, well, it's, you know, it's a very good question, but it's, it's different. So my debt is, spread out much more, I think, than, than Michael's wonderful recitation of those individuals in those positions. But also, don't you find, uh, when you go to somebody else's company to conduct something, you know, or when I go and do a director show somewhere that, that isn't connected with the Belfry, there's a, you know, you get a sense of whether you think that company is being 
run well or not, or whether you're being supported as a, you know, as an artist or not? I'm going to sound awful, but you know, the vast majority of my experiences are that the companies are not run by somebody passionate about the art of opera, or even the art of music. It seems to be because I'm going to bring the word product into the discussion. Mm. Because it seems to be the main thing for some companies is just to get a production up on the boards. To knock yourself out, to sacrifice, not to tolerate compromises, to push hard to get, and I have no pretensions, we're not the Met, we're not, you know, the Paris Opera. <laughs> but to, to get something that's close to the standard to which you yourself aspire and adhere, that's the thing. And by and large, in opera, I tend to miss that in our country. It's probably a good segue to my final questions. Uh, so I have, I've had three questions. I get two more. I'm going to put them together. And maybe I'll ask Timothy to start. We'll start with Timothy's follies, I think. <laughs> um, when you think about what you were able to create here and creating unusual works that were often challenging uh, for the audience or that seemed sort of out of the regular, it says something about the role of the artistic director. And in the operatic field, where is that role heading, do you think? And are you optimistic about the future of the role of artistic director? That's an excellent question, uh, to which there is, under the circumstances, we're here, we're speaking in early September of 2020, and we're all living with several months of the pandemic. We don't see where the future is going to be, even in terms of our individual companies and their aspirations for live performance. It's very hard for me, it's hard for everybody now, to get one's head up above this cloud and see further into the future. But as a performer, if I were an administrator only, I don't know what I'd be thinking. But as a performer, performers live from hope. Performers live from that ambition to share. I mean, you're a singer, you know what it's like. You want to get in front of an audience and share what you've got and show them how wonderful it is. And I feel, as a conductor, exactly the same way. So I haven't lost the ambition to get there with my colleagues because opera is very collegial. I mean, orchestra, conductor, OK, that's one dynamic. But opera, no, 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 no. Besides which, it's nice that in opera, conductors are still essential. Yes. Orchestras <laughs> now can play most of the standard repertoire on their own. You've seen even Japanese robot conductors doing Beethoven's Ninth with choruses and everything else. It's like, but opera, with all the breathing and changes and rubato, which is shifts in tempo and all those things that, to keep the ensemble tight, to keep it going in a direction, to keep it together, to keep it balanced, that's still a job for someone, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So optimistic, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. I do, I do. I, I share the optimism of the performers and singers and, and the directors I know. <laughs> I forgot the question. The question is, the role of artistic director, is that a changing thing in mm. theater? And are you optimistic about where that role is heading? I don't think it's a changing uh, role, but I think it's a role that has um, expanded or had more things added on to it. Uh, years ago, when I was at Theatre New Brunswick and at the Grand Theatre in London as artistic director, um, you know, since that time, since I've been at the Belfry, you know, our attention to uh, gender equity with directors and, and actors and designers, um, our, our embracing of Indigenous work and making sure that those artists are supported. And now, you know, not that we should have waited for this to happen, but you know, in light of uh, Black Lives Matter, to actually make sure that we're all um, addressing the diverse community and and taking on some kind of a leadership role as far as training and, you know, making it possible for members of that community to, to step into these roles. So um, I think the job of the, an artistic director is the same, but more. So it's a yes and. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a yes and situation. I mean, I think, I think I've changed as an, as an artistic director, but that, I don't think the role itself has changed. I think my approach to it has, has, has grown and evolved, as, as Timothy was saying. His has, you know. It's, it's a fascinating topic, and I know we could talk for much longer. However, um, 
I'm going to say I've had my five questions. You've had your fill of us. I've had my five. <laughs> uh, I was just trying to, I thought, you know, would I be able to at the end give my five takeaways? And there's so many things here. Um, I've learned to have to be a good writer. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea that the artistic director also looks after the artists, which we don't, when we think of artistic direction, I do think more about picking the work and a little less of that relationship, so I'm taking that away. Um, I think it's fascinating to think about the breadth of vision that it requires now, uh, which is a new thing, and I'm also excited that there's still the old piece of the tradition of what we have come from and the standards of that, that the artistic director holds. And I think I've also learned that each man who stands, or each woman, or gender neutral person who stands in that job uh, has a chance to make it their own with the skill set they bring. That and there is and something should. about that. And, should. And, should. and if you don't make it your own, then, then, then you're you trying to, to pander. Yeah. And, and I think we haven't talked enough about the, the relationship with the audience, which is, which is actually paramount. That's, the, um, that's yes. the dialogue that goes on all the time. And, exactly. and, and in a way, it's a, you know, it's a years long conversation with, with audiences, hopefully. You made the excellent point quite quickly earlier on about not following the audience, yeah. but leading them. Because if you leave it up to a, a vote. Oh, no, absolutely. No, I, 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 yeah, I always think we either have to show the audience the world from a different perspective or open a door to a world that, that yeah. the audience is not familiar with. There you go. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Timothy, thank for you. inviting Michael. Thank you, Michael, thank for you. coming thank and you. joining us in only talking. our second episode <laughs> thank you. of Take 5 with Timothy. Um, it's been a really great pleasure to hear both of you speak, and I've taken away more than five things, as I'm sure that's probably true for our audience as well. Thank you for joining us for Take 5 with Timothy. There'll be more of these to come, and we'll hear more guests, and we'll have more insights into the world of theater, music, opera, and the arts. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.